So welcome everyone to the Strumzy community call of 8 February 2024. Uh, we have several issues for discussion as the first thing on the agenda. Paolo, last time we said that you will have a look at this one. Well, the, um, the goal was actually, um, yeah, taking a look at this, but mostly uh, engaging together with Kyle, with the cruise control community. So if you follow the link um, at the bottom uh, by Kyle, which is the issue that he opened on the cruise control, uh, I engaged with them just for asking more uh, information about uh, why it seems they are pushing back to add this configuration, which makes sense to us in general. So to have a proper solution um, for um, for this problem. And uh, yeah, we haven't got any reply since two weeks. So I don't know if you want to wait more or uh, we want just to move forward with the, the fix that Kyle is providing uh, as a workaround in the, in the operator while waiting for uh, the risk control community to come back again. So what do you recommend? Well, after two weeks, uh, it's not so, so it's a long time, right? They, they didn't come back to us. So I will, uh, from my point of view, I will take again a look to the PR, uh, which is already approved by Federico and Shubham, for example, commented by you. And uh, I would say, yeah, if uh, it's a kind of workaround that works for us, let's move forward. And then we can revert back the change and having the proper solution increase control if the community will come back to us. Otherwise, we will live with this problem forever. Okay. The next issue is this one. So what do we plan to do with this? I guess that I should review it. I think this is a good content to have. It's not too uh, specific, but can help some users in configuring clients. The only thing I ask to add is maybe relevant metrics. So when you do these changes, you can measure if they have any good effects. Okay, Paula, maybe you can have a look at it to see what you think about it because like, I'm not convinced it's something that should be part of our documentation. But let's see what you think. Okay. Or anyone else from the maintainers, I think Federico likes it and Mikhail and Luke approved it, but 
if nothing else, we need another maintainer to approve it as well. Okay. The next issue is something in, uh, or PR is something I opened based on a discussion with some folks from the Carpenter project. Uh, so the way the drain cleaner works today is that the drain cleaner is an admission controller webhook which basically gets the eviction request and it has the power to approve the, the eviction requests or reject them. And the way it works today is it requires users to set the pod disruption budget to max available, unavailable zero, to basically block any disruptions. And then it captures the evictions and it kind of rolls the pod on its own but it actually passed the eviction to Kubernetes and uh, and Kubernetes basically reject eviction based on uh, the pod disruption budget. Now, this seems to work in some cases. It also doesn't seem to work in other cases. One of them is uh, apparently the Carpenter Kubernetes clusters. But I know from the past that there are some other environments where this doesn't work as well. And it's mostly because the pod disruption budget, which doesn't allow any restarts, indicates to them that this is a pod which will not be moved and they should not attempt to basically drain the node, restart the node, scale down the node, or whatever they need to do. And they don't even try to send the evictions. So what I tried after some suggestion from, from Jonathan from the Carpenter team was to actually not approve the eviction request in the webhook, but reject it. And that way, what we can do is uh, we can uh, have the pod disruption budget configured as normal without setting the max unavailable to zero and thus basically blocking the disruptions. But when the tooling tries to drain the node, then basically we still get the eviction webhook. We still annotate the pod for being moved, but instead of approving the eviction and passing it through the Kubernetes processing chain, we basically reject the eviction and that way we avoid the pod being deleted automatically by Kubernetes and have it rolled by the cluster operator. Now the advantage of this new mode is that you don't have to set the pod disruption budget to some specific configuration and it improves the compatibility with some of the tools or we are still yet to test it exactly with Carpenter, but assuming that it works there as we expect, then it improves the compatibility. And so I think that it's a better solution, but at the same time, it's possible that it somehow breaks the tools where it works today because the error we give for the eviction is different than uh, what we did before. Before it was Kubernetes rejecting the eviction because of the pod disruption budget. With this change, it's basically the drain cleaner rejecting the eviction because yeah, this pod should not be evicted, but it will be rolled by the operator. So the error, whoever is triggering the eviction gets is different. And uh, and the tools which work today might react a bit differently. Uh, and it's a bit hard to predict how will or will they not behave. For example, when you do kubectl drain manually, 
there's definitely a change where instead of retrying again and again, it basically sees the error as something what's not retriable and fails. And you basically have to rerun the kubectl drain. So the PR I actually opened keeps both options available in the drain cleaner and you can switch them. But it currently switches by default to to the new mode. But yeah, it's just draft PR and I wanted to see what you think about this. I'll give a look and, and try the, the new uh, process, how it works in practice. I think the main question is not about whether we should edit, but what should be the default, I guess. Okay, so if nobody has anything else to it, then someone edit this as the next PR to discuss. Yep, that was me. Um, I was just wanting to flag it because I think I've, I've solved all the issues that were outstanding earlier. So this is removing the dependency on OKHTTP and thus Kotlin. Um, but we've still maintained support for porting traces over gRPC and um, protobuf, depending on configuration. Um, there was a couple of issues with the build because of updated dependencies deprecating some of the semantic conventions used. Um, and so that's also worth having a bit of a think about whether the changes to those are... I, marked all the deprecated ones in the code and added their replacements where appropriate. Um, the only one that's probably worth paying particular attention to is HTTP URL changed into three component parts because HTTP URL was a client, part of the client spec, not the server spec, and we were tagging as server spans. So I took the opportunity to switch to the server conventions rather than the client conventions. And um, that's easily reverted if there's a preference for the old model. What does that mean for the users? Um, like, is that it's, internal it's... configuration or is that something user configures? It's just purely it, it, the set of tags attributes on the span is internal. It's not configurable by users. Oh, so it's tags on the span which get pushed into open telemetry? Yes. So it basically, if user was searching the traces through the old tags, you would have to update and use the new tags? Uh, the old tags are still emitted in this release um, for backwards okay. compatibility's sake. I've just marked them all for deletion post this release. Um, I don't know what cadence would be appropriate to remove them in. Um, I've documented all the changes in the release notes and then left deprecation warning, left, left to do comments on each one and needs removed later. And obviously that comes with the attached at express warnings on deprecations so that the build continues to work. Do you have any tracing tests in the British build model? I guess we don't for upgrades. No, we so don't. No. No, in general, it's something that uh, we are totally missing. So my, after my... Yeah, go on. 
No, no, I was just saying to, to Sam, sorry, after uh, uh, me answering a question, I saw now that you replied, so I didn't have the time to take a look. So I no was, worries. Yeah, I no was worries. skimming through the code right now. Uh, just to understand, so it seems that uh, um, you are able to, to exclude OKHTTP, OK right? Yes. And... Uh, Okay, without using uh, the JDK HTTP client. So the, um, there is this uh, sender JDK exporter from OpenTelemetry, or it's the JDK client, sorry. That is the JDK client, yes. Ah, okay, um, yes. Oh, just for, oh, okay. So you are adding the, the, the opportunity to use gRPC, right? With the JDK client using this gRPC managed channel. Uh, the, so there's, Two senders now in the dependencies. So we exclude the OKHTP OK sender and we add the gRPC sender and the JDK sender. And the gRPC sender requires the dependency on gRPC's sh shaded copy of Netty as well. Um, which we can debate at length whether we should add the depend additional dependency or not, but it it maintains backwards compatibility and removes the Kotlin dependency. Um, OpenTelemetry is already smart enough to say if you are depend if you are connecting to um, the if you it will default to gRPC and if you configure it to use Protobuf, it will select the right port already. Um, that's from also configure. I haven't had any, to do anything to change that. So it's, it's already got smart. So with this solution, we are saying that we don't need to move out from gRPC and go to HTTP as we thought at the beginning, but we can still support both together, right? Exactly. And we can still have gRPC as default one. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's interesting. I will take a look to the PR. Yeah, sorry for not jumping into it uh, straight, straight after that's okay. the question. Now, the other, the other thing that's probably worth noting on the defaulting of gRPC is upstream will change the default at some point from gRPC to protobuf um, in line with the open telemetry specs. But that's not included in this particular upgrade. Yep. Thanks, Paolo. Yeah, thanks to you, Sam. <clears throat> so I think this sounds reasonable, but I think it would be great before we release the bridge if we can also test the upgrades and so on for someone using tracing. Yeah, I see, I don't know, Lukas and Maros, do we have any kind of uh, tracing related system tests on the bridge side in the operator? Yeah, we have it uh, in the operators repo, but not in the bridge repository. So we can run the tests with uh, image with this change, at least for now. <laughs> Okay, any other PRs or issues anyone wants to discuss? If not, then uh, I don't think we have any new proposals. Uh, but the tiered storage proposal and the replication factor change in the topic operator proposals were merged and approved or approved and merged. And that's the right order. So, uh, yeah, that's something what's done on the proposal side. Now we have to do the implementation. Anyone has anything else to proposals?
If not, then issue triage is next. Uh, I guess this is the oldest one. So this is something I opened. I don't know if you remember some time ago we triaged this is actually the PR but triage this issue which is about how the additional properties are marked in our CRD definitions whether it's using Kubernetes preserve unknown fields or whether it's using this additional properties option and I think someone raised it because some tools have some weird handling when they are preserve unknown fields in the CRDs. Uh, apparently Terraform has some issues with it. But what I found is that this change is not completely backwards compatible. And if you have in the metadata some annotations like this, where you define the annotation value as integer, then the original code which we have had is something that we can easily handle with unknown properties, uh, not necessarily through anything special in Strimzy, but by basically, I guess, Jackson handling the conversion to string on its own when uh, converting the custom resource uh, into the Java object. And the uh, unknown fields, they don't in any way prevent integer from being used in the CRD. So it lets user create a resource like this. And it correctly translates it into the Strimzy object with a map of string keys and string values. But after the change, when using the additional properties that actually works only for string keys and string values on the CRD level. And Kubernetes basically rejects this, uh, this integer value there and requires the, the value to be basically quoted as string. So I think there are several things to consider like the obvious issue is that it's not backwards compatible. And if you have already resource like this, then you can actually run into problems and you might not be able to create it or change it. That said, the annotations, for example, are in Kubernetes in general have always string values. So if you would be, for example, configuring annotations on a regular objects in its metadata, then this is the way how you have to configure annotations. You cannot just have there an integer. So uh, I guess this change brings us closer to how it should actually look like in the API from the Kubernetes perspective, because it works like Kubernetes changes. Uh, and I guess it improves the compatibility with some tools such as Terraform, but yeah, it doesn't seem to be fully compatible with what we allowed in the API before. So I guess we have to decide if we keep it and risk that it will break something for unknown number of users or if we decide to, and in that case, or, or if you basically decide to roll back this change and revert to what we had before, which allows the integer value there. Just a question, Jakob. Um, has this change already gone out? The change you took, the change it was made to Strimzy, has that already gone out in the release already? No, it's been done in in this release, so it's not released right. yet. It's for zero forty. That's nasty, isn't it? Um, 
I mean, certainly the way you explained it, I kind of came around to thinking the change that's introduced this thing is really a fix of a bug that was in there all along because we accepted things that weren't strings. And I think the error message that you get from the API server is pretty clear about what you need to do in order to make the CRD acceptable to the API server. So I'm inclined to think we should not try to fix this. So I realize that's, you know, it's difficult to know how many people would be affected by this change. Um, but that's my take on it. Yeah, I was having thoughts along the lines that Tom just expressed there. You know, I was thinking, well, we shouldn't try to fight Kubernetes and Kubernetes conventions. Yes, I hear there's a backward compatibility issue, but weighing those two things up, um, I'm I'm in the first camp rather than the second. But yeah, like Tom says, it's impossible to know how big a impact this is going to have on the community. Should we use a kind of feature gate to for this so that users are cannot use feature gate because that's CRD definition. Okay, right. Yeah, on my side, I agree. Uh, I have nothing to add to what already Tom and Keith said, so. So like this, and we close it. Do we need to document this? I can open a PR to edit to the change log. Okay. So another issue again from me, but open based on the discussion. I think Mikhail suggested it, if I remember correctly. So today we try to prevent the users from scaling down nodes that are not empty or removing the broke role in craft mix notes from them when they are not empty, but we don't seem to do any kind of prevention from uh, removing a disk that is not empty from NJBot array, which essentially might have the same impact. So the idea was that maybe we can implement some logic similar to the scale down or all change and prevent this removal uh, in the operator. I guess that's a reasonable feature. Yeah, it makes sense to me. One question, how are we, what's the source of truth for the disk being, the volume being empty? Kafka admin API, I guess. Doesn't it 
doesn't it tell us on which path the yeah yeah it does it does and the reason i asked was just to obviously you know storage can fail and i was just wondering if there's a, a tricky corner case if the storage fails um and therefore the emptiness check fails but if we're taking this from the kafka metadata then i think we're okay so yeah seems reasonable Okay. Uh, so let's keep it that said um based on the experience from the previous work done by Shubham and me on this I'm not sure this is something what's super easy to do so I'm not sure I want to mark it as help wanted to be honest because it can be quite tricky to implement it. So I would probably just keep it as enhancement. Sounds fair enough. Okay, the next issue, I guess, is asking for a Helm chart for the Kafka custom resource itself, or I don't really know for sure. The Helm chart, which is linked, doesn't seem to have any documentation. So historically, we didn't want it to have a Helm chart to deploy any of the custom resources because of the amount of options and the related testing and kind of this weird approach where everyone wants to add some option for something. My personal view is that we should maybe stick with that and not try to create any Helm chart like that. So we should reject this, but does anyone feel differently? No, that's my feeling as well. It let me think of something like uh, the old OpenShift template that, you know. Yeah, I mean, Helm chart is way more powerful than that was. Right? Yes, yeah, yes, but I don't know. So as you say, but, a lot can come with yeah. different asking. <laughs> Yeah, I think you, with the Kafka custom resource, you can easily have hundreds of different options just to combine different things. Yeah.
flow like this? Does it make sense? Yeah, that looks good to me. Yep. Okay. Next one is from Mike, and it's about adding the Kafka topic ID into the Kafka topic spec. Uh, status, uh, not spec, to the Kafka topic resource status. That seems fairly useful. I guess Tom just commented on it. Tom, you can just speak on the call. I can, yeah. I can read out what I wrote if you like. Um... I think no, this is probably fine and not that hard to do in the UTO. Um, it would be worth thinking through. Yeah, I think this is probably fine. Fede, what, what do you think? Yes, I think it's useful. We already have the topic name and other a bunch of information, and this is this can be useful for some tooling like some UI, something like this. I think that's exactly what Mike is asking for it because yeah, yeah. I can have, I can have a look at this when, when I'm done with the PR about because changes. So I guess we should follow up with Tom's suggestion and do it in UTO only. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, strictly speaking, the bidirectional topic operator should be removed after the next release. So anyway, not that much time to do it in there. Okay, so like this. Yeah. So what labels do we put there? If you look into it, Federico, then I guess we just yeah, I'll put, in triage. yeah, I'll put in my backlog so as soon as I can, I will work on this. Okay, and the last issue to triage is again by me. Why are most of the issues created by me? Uh, so this is something what came up from discussion with. Jakub Stejskal and, uh, and David and others. Uh, so today, when the manual rolling update fails, then it fails the whole reconciliation. And it can fail for reasons such as it cannot roll a craft controller because the other controllers are not in sync and so on. And that can lead to a situation where, for example, due to some storage issue, you lose the persistent volume claim and persistent volume of one of the controller nodes. But at the same time, either through doing something else or maybe through Drew Cleaner, one of the controllers is annotated for manual rolling update. And what happens is that when the pot of the controller without the missing, without the PVC is restarted and the pot is created, but it will be pending, and at the same time, the reconciliation in uh, the in the in the regular Kafka CR reconciliation, it basically tries to roll manually the pot annotated for it, but it cannot roll the pot because another controller is not running and it doesn't have the quorum, so it basically fails the reconciliation. But because that fails the reconciliation, it kind of never creates the persistent volume claim for the pending controller to 
get started and up and running. And because the PVC for that is never created, the manual running update of the controller keeps failing again and again. So it's kind of a loop without any recovery. So what I'm suggesting here is that we can, in the manual running update, we can basically catch the issues from the manual running update. We can log them, but we should proceed with the reconciliation as normally. We should not fail it. And that would, at least in some situations like the one described, which I think happened already twice, at least in the in the test environment, uh, it would kind of allow, give the operator chance to, for example, recreate the PVCs or do any other changes to recover. And what can happen to the pod marked for the manual rolling update is if it doesn't need a regular rolling update, then... Uh, yeah, the reconciliation will not be able to do the manual running update once, but it will then recreate the PVCs. It will go through the other part that will allow the pending controller to get up and running. And sometime later when that gets in sync, it will be able to manually roll the, roll the pot through the manual rolling update or if there are actually some other reasons to do a regular rolling update of the controller mark for the manual rolling update then well it happens through the normal rolling update and the manual rolling update annotation is removed through that so it it seems to me like this should not cause any harm to the manual rolling update process, but it can improve how Strumzy handles some edge situations like this. But I wanted to see if anyone else had some situations come to their mind where this would break things or cause some problem. I think in spite of the excellent verbal description that you've given there, Jakob, I would need some time to think this all through. Okay. Think, think. English is hard. Sorry, does this mean we need to somehow differentiate Kafka roller manual rolling update failing because of PVC? No, I or don't think I don't think generally. we care. I don't okay. think we care why it failed. And it's also like you don't know that it failed because of PVC, like what you will see in the locks in the exact situation I described there is basically it will say that the craft controller with ID2 cannot be rolled because there's no craft quorum, but the Kafka roller itself has, has not an understanding about why it doesn't have the, why the controllers don't have the quorum. It doesn't know that there's some other controller that is in a pending state because of missing PVC or or anything like that. So yeah, I, I don't think that needs anything special. And there might be other errors than this specific one. So yeah, I think what we should do there is basically just, yeah, if the manual rolling update fails, then we just log it, but proceed with the reconciliation regardless of what the exact error is. Okay, so we keep this for next time. And that's it for the triage.
Okay, the last thing I added to the agenda is that a reminder that the CFP for the StreamZicon 2024 is now open, so you can propose your sessions. Paolo, I don't know if you have anything more to, to StreamZicon. No, <laughs> just that the line is March uh, 10th, so, but yeah. Okay, and that brings us to the end of the call, which was quite long today. Does anyone have anything else to discuss? In that case, thanks a lot for joining the call and see you next time. See you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.